Hey you, Nina here. You are officially listening to Triggered Can We Play With That wherever you get your podcasts. Today is a special bonus episode, my friends. If you are not following me on Instagram at Drama Therapist Nina, now's a good time to do that because the special bonus episode for today is going to be my story. And I'm going to tell you now, the material of the story may feel dark for a lot of listeners and viewers. Yes, it may feel dark, But of course, what I'm inviting you to do is to lean into those hard moments, those sticky moments, those uncomfortable moments, and find a way to transform it into a teachable moment. Yes, we want to transform hard conversations into teachable moments. And so that's my invitation for you today. We are going to play with it. You're going to see me smile. You're going to see me laugh, right? We're going to play with it, and we're still going to go into some scary territory. So... If it sounds like your jam, keep listening in. We are going to be playing with suicidality today. I know I said it. Take a breath in and relax, right? At least come to a grounded neutral state. And if you have a journal, that would be fantastic. If not, have a friend to dialogue with what comes up for you in this episode, right? The whole point is get the conversation started, yeah? We're going to get this carnal started kind of thing. That's the kind of energy that we want to have with this, yes? Yes. Now, of course, we're not going to touch on everything, right? I'm not going to teach you about suicidality. I'm going to share a human to human moment and then we're going to play with it. Yeah. I've got my bestie, Deb, who's going to be in the video. You'll just see in a second. She's pretty awesome. And without further ado, get your bestie, get your journal, get the other things you need. My question to you is, are you ready to play? Welcome to Triggered. Can we play with that? You know that moment when your emotions ramp up in an instant, leaving you feeling helpless, frozen, or out of control? In that moment, you've been emotionally hijacked, the very definition of triggered. And I want to ask you, can we play with that? I'm Nina El Garcia, drama therapist and empowerment coach of Houston Creative Arts Therapy. Join me as we discover ways to empower you and the people who mean the most to you to transform hard conversations into teachable moments. Triggered. Real playful. Real respectful. Real empowered. Let's take a breath. All right, everybody, welcome to this very special episode of Triggered Can We Play With That? You're going to be hearing my story today, and I do have a very special guest on with us. Hi, Deb. Hey, girl. Hey. (laughs) So before we get into anything, uh, we're going to set the intent, as always, folks. The intent is to have a human to human conversation, right? We want to say, yes, I am consenting to this. I want to, you know, go into potentially sticky territory, potentially uncomfortable territory. And I want to transform a hard conversation into a teachable moment. Do you consent, Deborah Alexis? Yes, ma'am. Amen. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So before I go on and I tell my story, question for you. Let's let the listeners and the viewers know a little bit about you. What identities, roles, labels, titles, imagery, energy, which just feels most present about you that you would want people to know in this moment? Um, I would say that right now I am also in the mental health field. Like Nina, that's how we met. Um, yay, F that place, but yay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just a black social worker. I'm a dog mom, and just taking it one one day at a time. That's it. That's all you can do, right? One day at a time. Sometimes one hour at a time. Very much so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So thank you so much for checking in, letting us know about you and uh, we'll keep going. The way we usually do this is you would be telling a story, but today is my story. And so I'm going to lead this episode and you're going to co-host with me the way that your awesome energy allows. And we always start like this internal weather check-in before I share the story and my internal weather check-in. Interesting. Okay. So it's like me 
and there's a spotlight on me, but I'm like holding my legs together. Like I'm sitting on a stage and I'm holding Mm -hmm. my legs with my arms in and I'm looking out at the audience and the spotlight is on me. Everything else is dark. That's my internal weather right now. And it feels, I think it feels cold. What are you picking up from that? I I feel, <laughs> I feel like that's kind of reflective of what you're doing right now, right? Like you're you're telling your story so it can feel um like all eyes on you because you know they are on you or mm-hmm. all ears are on you rather. Um and so it it's the fitting. I can see it. Yeah. Um, I think in particular, even what you just said, right? The reality of like, when we tell a story enough, when we lean into something enough and we tell it enough, it becomes much easier to share it, right? It's the weather gets Mm -hmm. warmer. It's like what more comfortable, but the story that I'm going to share today has not actually been shared publicly. Mm. And that is why I think that like sitting on the stage, holding the legs, spotlight is hitting me and it's all dark, right? And the audience is out there. I know that they're out there, but it's all dark, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's why it's showing up that way. Cause this is an unusual internal weather check-in for me. Usually I'm like, I'm ready. Let's go. The elements are all around me, but this one feels like (laughs) cold. And I think fear, I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, someone there's like, ah, anxiety is here. The story's about to be told. Are you ready to hear the story? Yes, please. Please tell me more. So the title of this moment, because when we think about stories, right, it's easy for us to like, be like, and then I did this, and then this is what happened. And like, we get a lot of actual different moments and meshed as if they were one, right? Mm-hmm. But really we're feeling different things in different moments. And so in this case, when I have the moment that I'm thinking of, I've titled it when suicidality creeps in, right? So mm. already, right, if, if in the body, if, if you might be noticing like a dropping or it got colder or there's like a, a resistance, right? Because for a lot of people, suicidality is scary. Mm-hmm. And some people are going to be like, wait, I don't even know what suicidality means. <laughs> Shall we educate? Yes. <laughs> Teach the people. Let them know. <laughs> so I think it's, it's, at least popularly known, right? When we think about if someone is suicidal, I think there's that polarized thinking that pops in and it's like, well, you're either suicidal or you're not, right? I think this is a common, common enough thought. And I think one of the takeaways that I actually want people to take from this is like, it's not that black and white. Let's get some spectrum thinking on this because we can have very passive suicidality, right? Or we can have very active suicidality. And while this episode is not going to teach people, right, about suicidality, right, head to Google, talk to your therapist, talk to your doctor, right, if that's the case. What it is going to do is we're going to share a real moment um, of my mm-hmm. life in which suicidality did creep in. And that one of the takeaways yeah. that I'm hoping that people, yeah, you know, is take away is that like this is a human thing that re- resilient, strong, badass people can also still struggle with suicidality, right? And that your mental health must come first. It must come first when this pops up on the radar, right? This isn't this thing that you're like, oh, well, let me just deal with that next week. Or, oh, let me just put it under the carpet. Or, can I just hide this in the closet? I'm just going to pretend that doesn't exist. It just, it, okay. it doesn't work that way, right? Uh, and so we talk about that a lot on the show that when, you know, what is a trigger? Well, if you, if you don't deal with your emotions, they are going to deal with you, right? Like they will find a way to express themselves. They, yes. Amen. Say that again, girl. <laughs> okay. We're going to dial it back. I said, I said, <laughs> if you don't find a way to express your emotions, they will find a way to express you, right? Emotion is energy that must be expressed. And so Mm -hmm. if we're not going to do it, it's still there waving its flag with its horn. And it's like, see me, hear me, feel me. And I'm like, okay, I see you. Right. What we don't want to do is put it away because it will find Mm -hmm. a way back out. Right. So I guess we're at the point where I I share my story in a nutshell. Are you ready? Yes, please. Please share your story with us today. Picture it. I'm going through a divorce at the time. And... Throughout the divorce process, there are lots of feelings, and I have spoken at length about this on the podcast. The grief, I think, is one of the biggest feelings, one of the biggest emotions 
and, and grief is really a process, right? It's filled with sadness, which is an emotion and whatnot. We won't get too much into the nitty gritty details, but the grief that comes from believing and having faith that you would have a family, that you would have a marriage, oh. a partner, right? That would show up for you no matter what, right? The grief that comes when you realize that person does not choose that with you. That you are not chosen, that the life you plan to have is not being chosen by that person. And then in, which is in my case, having to deal with, you know, oh, well, <clears throat> not only is it that they don't want this marriage, they're not willing to say they don't want the marriage. So now I have to say this marriage has to end because you don't want to show up in the marriage. So not only mm -hmm. that and the grief and the responsibility of that, but then we also shared a house together. We also like property, right? And we also shared a child together. And mm -hmm. I'm pretty positive, having been through several intense breakups in my life, that if we had not shared a child together, I don't think suicidality would have crept in. Yeah the grief of losing the idea of what I thought would be a family was so intense that I remember at the time processing it. I joined a grief support group for specifically for divorced people, right? I was like, I'm going to process mm -hmm. this. I'm going to lean in. It's what I would invite my clients to do. It's what I'm going to do, right? This is me being emotionally courageous. I'm going to handle it. And then, and then he was like, well, Nina, you know, when it comes to L." you know, our, our shared child, when it comes to her, I think that we need to start switching off every other weekend. And it had been every other day. Now I know that that's unusual for divorced people to share their child every other day, but we passed her off at school and it wasn't an issue. But then he asked for every other weekend, the whole weekend. And the fear and the anger that I felt was so intense. I agreed I agreed to it because I knew that it was in her best interest, right? It wasn't about me. It wasn't about him. It was really what was in her best interest. And I was absolutely for that. But let me tell you, Debra, when that happened and I started to move forward with those weekends and not having her and having to be by myself, all of a sudden what started popping up was identities and roles that were present. It was like, oh, you don't have her because you weren't a good enough wife. You don't have her because mm -hmm. you're not a good enough mother. You don't have her because you can't control things in your life. Your life is out of control, right? So these thoughts start popping up and they're automatic, right? It's not like I'm like, oh, I want to think all those things, right? No, it doesn't work like that, right? So these thoughts start popping up. I can't control them. There they are, but they don't stop there, right? It's not just the one thought. Then it becomes and became, you know, you're not a good enough mother. That's why she's hauling off right now, right? Now, mind you, my daughter is like two at this point in time, right? And it, children will do what children will do, right? They're very emotional, um, especially mm -hmm. toddlers, right? They haven't yet learned how to regulate. But I very distinctly began having moments. And this is when that suicidality crept in. Mm -hmm. Began having moments of, and it started with the voice, which had been quiet at first and slowly raised in volume over time. And what it was saying was, you're not a good enough mother. Look at how you can't control your child. You shouldn't even be her mother. What you need to do is, and slowly this is what crept in, what you need to do is you need to take her now and you need to drop her off at her father's. And then you need to buy a plane ticket to the nearest place that has a mountain. And you need to do the research on what that is now so that you know what it is in case you ever need to enact this plan. You need to go to the top of the mountain and then you need to throw yourself off of the mountain. So it is, I hear a lot of thoughts around like your parenting and your role as a mother. Have you, did you have those thoughts before the divorce? Like, were you, um, for lack of a better word, like insecure about your, your mothering or your parenting rather? That's a no, Deborah. I thought I was a badass mom. <laughs> I still think so I'm a badass what mom. Do you, is it the divorce in particular? Is it something that you said because... Mm -hmm um you know from the it? outside looking in mm -hmm. yeah because I would think okay maybe being down on yourself about being a wife but the mother part um okay talk to us about how we got there yes so I listen when when the thoughts first start popping up and I heard that I was like what the 
what the the F was that? Right. I was like, that's out of left field. That's not me. And I was like, you need to pay attention to that. And the first time it happened, it was a really emotionally overwhelming moment. And I I was like, it was a one-time thing, right? Like, oh, that was dark. That's what I remember thinking. I was like, oh, that was dark. (laughs) Like, well, you should, you know, just, you just need to get a little bit more control in your life. But she didn't go away, right? And I say she very particularly Mm -hmm. because when you just brought in, what you brought in is like roles, right? The role of the wife, the role of a mother, right? Mm -hmm. And I did not believe consciously that I was a poor wife or a poor mother, right? I did not believe those things. What I did, and this is me processing after it, when she started to come back and she started to get louder and that she was more frequent, I was, I was dealing with her every week. Mm-hmm. It was a problem. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to put this under the carpet. I'm not going to put this in the closet. I have to be able to know what's going on with this part. What about me is emotionally hijacked that she's what's popped up right? Mm. When I look at a suicidal thought or this piece, this is a part of me that is trying to communicate something to me, right? It's trying to communicate that I'm so overwhelmed with something in my life that I feel so out of control, so helpless with something in my life that this is the, what must be the best solution, right? Which of course is not the case, but this is what that emotional part is thinking short-term, right? It's not thinking long-term for me. And so when she popped up, I did the thinking, just like you said, I said, what is this around? First off, I said, what is this part? If this part were like a person or a creature or a thing, what is she? And I ended up uh, calling her the divorcee. Mm. She's the divorcee. And I said, what is this? Like, where, why did she show up? I did everything I could as a wife. My partner didn't want to be with me at the end of the day, right? That wasn't mm-hmm. on me, right? They had their own, own things going on. I said, so what is it? And I was like, what am I failing as a mom? Do I feel like I'm not? And I was like, no, like I'm showing up. My kid is excelling. She's beyond her peers. What is this? When it finally settled that it was specifically not the wife, not the mother, the divorcee part, what she was holding on for me was all the resentment and the anger and the bitterness that I might've felt. I didn't feel those things. She was feeling them for me. Does it make sense? Yeah, it's giving a uh, very much IFS. Uh, yeah, internal family systems. Is that yeah. kind of where you're drawing that from? Ooh, look at us. <laughs> so it is very IFS, right? For anybody who's out there yeah. and you're very interested in parts work, go pick up an internal family systems book, right? That's a great way to dive into it. Now, what people don't know is because I'm a drama therapist, I'm dealing with parts work all the time, but my language mm-hmm. is different than IFS. So I could I couldn't tell you what like the IFS parts, like what he would call this. Um, Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that in a drama therapy world, my job is to say, I have a cast of characters, right? My cast of characters within Nina, they're playing all the time. The mother, the sister, the wife, the therapist, right? All the different things. They're always there, but they're not always in the spotlight. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so when I work with clients, it's the same thing. I'm like, you know, you've come to me with a problem. You have a cast of characters somebody's too loud or somebody's not loud enough. Now, how do we, you know, reimagine and rework these characters that you have so that you're showing up in a more balanced way? It was the same thing that I did for myself. I was like, you're not showing up in a balanced way. Some part of you is hauling off saying you must deal with this. You are failing. Mm -hmm. And in order to not be a failure, you need to go throw yourself off of a cliff somewhere. Right. And if I hadn't done the work and figured that out, I would not have been able to find a solution. She wouldn't have just gone away um, mm-hmm. you know, for, for me, right? I don't, and I don't have a crystal ball. That's something I like to say too, right? I don't know exactly what would have happened, but all evidence points to trying to figure out how to be a single mom, trying to figure out how to keep my house at the time, incredible stressors, right? Of the divorce. Mm-hmm. Is it likely that she would have just gotten softer as I keep adding more stress? No, right? Like this just not logically probable. And so I did, I leaned in and I got to know the divorcee part, you know, and, and uh, I got to know her. I got to know what it was that she was hanging on to. And again, she was my anger. She was my resentment. She was all that, that I didn't feel she was feeling it for me. You know, I was like, oh, I gotta, I gotta feel those things. I (laughs) I gotta feel my feelings, you know? So how did she ever tell you like why it showed up in terms of criticizing your motherhood and not other things like your your therapist role, your 
your partner role, your human role, like why motherhood specifically? I think like that ties what do you into, think triggered that? Yeah, I think it ties into, and do you remember how I was talking about the grief that divorce brought me around family, the idea of a family? Mm -hmm. For me, I think that the role of wife and mother were so intertwined because family mm -hmm. as an idea was this enmeshed image, right? That it had this, I had a tapestry of what a family should be, right? My family is yeah. going to be me, my partner, and however many children we have. That's our family, right? And that's an idea that's been conditioned in me since, since before I could remember, I'm sure, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also something that as an adult, I've embraced. I've, I wanted a family. I've, I've always wanted a family. And I very intentionally, you know, had a child uh, with someone I loved, right? And so wouldn't take that back for the world. And yet, when I think about why did she show up in that way, you know, what a poignant question you ask. I, I think that's why it's my beliefs around what a family should have been. And if you couldn't do it as a wife, I'm positive that she pulled in, then you're failing as a mother too. Even mm. if I didn't have evidence to support that. Do you feel like, um, do you feel like you going through with the divorce would be a disappointment to your daughter? No. No, I think okay. a lot of people, even that I, you know, was dating at the time too, they were like, you know, oh, well, what do you, don't you worry that like, don't you, wouldn't, don't you worry that like, she's not going to be okay that like what the divorce is going to do to her. And I was like, she's too. <laughs> well, I mean, she's, she's right. I think when people think about that, what they imagine is again, they have an image of what a divorce is, right? Like this ugly, mm -hmm. nasty tear down thing where everybody's arguing in the household. And like, I think there's a very particular image around divorce. My divorce was not like that very intentionally. When I realized we were having issues, I brought it up. We went to therapy, right? We did all these things because I wanted to keep leaning in, all right? I didn't want it to end up that way. I didn't want to be triggered around these things. And, and I remember having that conversation early on with my partner. And I was like, this does not have to be ugly, right? This situation does not have to be ugly. I love you enough to let you go. That is how I look at this divorce, right? Not, excuse me, not that we failed, not that we were, you know, uh, I'm not going to lie and say we had an abusive marriage. We did not, right? We had a marriage that was not working. We had a partnership mm -hmm. that was not a partnership. And so, you know, I, I very distinctly remember having that conversation early on and saying, you know, that's, it's not about us failing as, as individuals or as a couple, even it, this isn't working in any of our best interests. And I will love you enough to let you go. Mm. And so I've really let love and compassion continue moving forward with me in this process. I think it's been real important, but, but it, even all the love and compassion and, you know, coping skills and, you know, group therapy could not stop that suicidality from creeping in because I had to acknowledge that yes, Nina, there's love and compassion. And you also are angry about this. And you also resent that he didn't do everything that you did to try to make it work. And that's okay. what the divorce saying needed me to hear. That's what I needed to hear was that I was angry about it, even though I let him go with love and compassion. Yeah, I was effing angry about it. I was like, I was angry and a part of me, right? And a part of me did resent the fact that he didn't do everything that I had done, right? When I acknowledged that, I let the divorcee write a letter. She wrote a letter. And she said a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. and I said a bunch of stuff to her and we said a bunch of stuff to mm -hmm. other people, but I kept being with her and I kept letting her show up so that she wasn't triggered anymore, that I wasn't triggered anymore and that the world could feel safe and stable and in my control again. And after oh. I wrote the final letter, the final letter I wrote was to my ex, my ex-husband. And that was the final letter that I wrote detailing the things that I had felt, I said, you don't even need to read this letter. This is for me to write. It is not about you reading it. But here's the things that I was angry about. Here's the things that I resented. And here's all the loving things that I said. And here's all the compassionate things that I have for our marriage, you know, and I'm ready to release this. Girl, I sent hey. that letter. Never heard from the divorcee again. That's it. She just hey. disappeared. Because she was just like, okay, my job here is done. My job here is done. Yeah. Do you feel like, um, like, because 
you know, as, as mental health providers, like getting walks a hot mess for me sometimes, you know what I mean? And um, sometimes maybe because we know what needs to happen, we think about it too hard and we don't stop to like feel the feeling. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I'm getting divorced. Um, you know, people who are going through grief need to join a support group. So let me join a support group, but never stopping to be like, man, like, wait, can we curse? No. You can't have like, like an album. <laughs> <laughs> like this would suck. Like, you know, like actually feeling that instead of going through the motions of what we would tell our clients to do is kind of I know I get stuck there right so I'm like Deborah what would you tell a client okay you would tell a client x y and z and so I try to do that but neglect the fact that you know I need to sit in bed and kind of just feel this and let mm -hmm. let that ride out instead of like trying to intellectualize fix it okay what theories would I apply you know just like mm -hmm. being present and being like in it for a little bit can be a little difficult for me do you feel like that kind of played a role in you um not addressing the anger and frustration that caused uh divorce day to pop up I think for me because I'm regularly leaning in right and I'm regularly saying like what can I look at now what can I look at now so that I don't feel those things what I think was happening at that time was, you know, I had a partner who was not functioning, would not do the paperwork, would not move us forward, would not respond to emails, would not. And so what I was doing was I was over-functioning. I was trying mm. to end the marriage at the same time that I was trying to respect my partner, at the same time that I was trying to keep myself stable, at the same time that I was trying to be a single mom. Like it was all of these things of this like over-functioning, over-functioning, over-functioning and trying to keep everything together that what I think naturally happens for anyone when their life is unstable, right? Is you just have to, you're just like, I just got to make it through this. And then I'll be able to, then I'll be able to focus on me. Right. And so even that I was like, I, I put myself in the group therapy and I was like, great, that'll be my me time. Right. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to get her voice out. What I needed was to feel mm -hmm. my feelings but I don't think I had access to really even looking at them because my body was like, like don't no. worry, Nina, we got you. We're just going to stick this under the carpet for you. You're, it's not even going to be intentional, right? I'm like, this is, this is what happens for everybody everywhere. This is why we get triggered. This is why mm -hmm. suicidality creeps in is because there is something that is stuffed up under the carpet, in the closet, in the attic, wherever it is. And we're not looking at it. You know, we're not looking mm -hmm. at it, but those emotions, they, they pop up for a reason, all of our emotions pop up for a reason. They have a message to send us. I think often what we do is we misinterpret, right? Or we say, you know, yeah. oh, well, I'm going to have more control over this. So if I just do X, Y, Z, then I should be fine. When the reality is sometimes we need to move forward and do things. And sometimes we need to sit back and settle. We need to listen into what's, what's the settle in here. What's the underneath this, what's at the core, you know? And that's what it was. It was the Nina, you don't even have time to feel anger and resentment right now because you'd fall apart right? Which is survival. Oh. I needed to survive, but I also needed to have the time and wherewithal to say, this matters too, right? Oh. That this, I need to know how to show up for myself because I damn sure I can't show up for my kid. If I'm thinking about, you know, if I have this part of me, that's like, it's time to throw yourself off a cliff, mm -hmm. you know? So that is the story in a nutshell. That is, uh, I think what I'm really hoping that people continue to get out of this is being able to have these conversations and, mm -hmm. and not, not be afraid, right? Or if there is fear to say, I'm still going to be courageous enough to acknowledge that this is a problem for me, right? That if I have these automatic mm -hmm. thoughts um, and they're causing dysfunction in my life, right? Then it's a problem. What can I do to lean in? What can I do to deal with it? You know? Um, of the many options that there are, I just, my real hope is that people just have conversations about it, you know, conversations mm -hmm. with themselves, conversation with other people. I might put the leaning in diagram y'all for people who are out there asking, well, how do I do that? How do I do that? I have a diagram for you, the leaning in diagram. And <laughs> <laughs> there is, there is a way to do that. Right. Um, but I think we underestimate the power of just listening to the self. Yeah. Yeah. So going 
uh, when the things you're saying are just like, because I'm trying to read a book about IFS right now. Um, and one of the things he, he said is that, um, you know, those parts that are troubling are really parts that are protective. Bingo. Um, yes. And so in this book, he said, when I asked these protective parts, what they do is they trusted they didn't have to protect. They often wanted to do something opposite of the role that they were in. So, um, you know, those those parts that are, uh, you know, seemingly are leaning towards destructive parts, they're trying to just like, they're trying to protect you, Mm -hmm. but they'd rather be doing something else, you know, Mm -hmm. and not be on the defensive. Yeah. So... That's so, so important. I just want to like highlight what you just said, because the reality is for anybody who comes into my office and they share something like this, right? I'm really struggling with this. I've got a, you know, and I'm like, we've got a part that's this. I wish I didn't have an alcoholic part. I wish I didn't have an angry part. I wish I didn't write. And I'm like, listen, what if we just reframe that? Because here's the reality. That part popped up at some point in your life to protect you. It is mm-hmm. protecting you from something. Now, it also does not believe that you know how to protect yourself. So if we can put you in charge and you feeling confident in your life and able to protect yourself, it will lower its volume and it will sit back again, right? I have this image that I offer clients. And when we talk about emotions, and this is so valuable for everyone listening and watching, like just take this image with you, if nothing else, if we can imagine, right? It's like, let's say we have five core emotions, right? You've got your anger, your sadness, your fear, Mm -hmm. your disgust, and your joy, right? It's like inside out. Here it is. Yes, Disney. Thank you. So you've got your emotions, right? And they're like, when you come into this world, they're your soldiers. Their job is to stand at attention. And if you can imagine, they're like in a line and they're standing at attention. And anytime there's something that happens in your environment that calls them forward, they step out of that line, put their hand on your shoulder. And they're like, I've got this. We're supposed to be sad right now, right? Tears, cue the tears, right? Or we're supposed to yell right now, right? If anger pops out, whatever the case is, right? But then what we need is for them to go back in line, right? We need them to go back in line. But what ends up happening is for many of us, a particular emotion steps forward in a large enough context, right? A big enough moment happens, or it happens often enough that they keep stepping forward, keep stepping forward. Mm -hmm. Eventually what they do is, you know, they come forward and they say, you know what? I've got this. Why don't you sit down? I'm going to handle this now. Yeah. And this is it, right? Then we start to identify as like, well, I'm an angry person because my anger has not sat Mm -hmm. itself down in a while right? And so Mm -hmm. I identify as this instead of saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, actually, this is just a part of me that feels this way temporarily in this moment, right? But it's all for protection. And so the second that we're like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, you've popped up, I may be misinterpreting, you're not trying to ruin my life. You believe that you're trying to keep me safe from this. That's why you make me isolate. That's why you make me turn to alcohol. That's why you like fill in the blank, right? That's why you make me think I want to jump off a cliff, right? I don't really want to do that. What I want is to not be overwhelmed by my emotional state. That's what Mm -hmm. I want. And if I had the skills and tools to do that, I could protect myself and you wouldn't need to pop up at all. Mm -hmm. So what do you think now that divorcee is not trying to yeah, she's get you off of Mount Everest. She's been reintegrated. She's, she's been reintegrated. Okay. That's how I'll put her. <laughs> she's not doing something more positive now. She's just, okay, I'm out. This was a... I mean, supportive role. Look at you with your little dramatic exploration. Okay. So (laughs) if, if I were in session with a client, actually, so what I might do to play with this part is I would say right now I would check in and I would ask the divorcee, like I check in and I check into my body physically, mentally, emotionally, right? And I ask myself, you know, where am I feeling the divorcee? She's in my chest. She's sitting in a rocking chair. She's got a book. Oh, she's on a porch uh some land around her what book is she reading something about homemaking oh i thought she was reading how stella got her groove back (laughs) hey no that's another part bro that's a whole nother episode (laughs) we'll have deb on again next week (laughs) okay (laughs) that's a whole nother episode there is a part for that but that's not the divorcee no (laughs) the divorcee is yeah she's like on property like she's got some land around her her hair is up and like this little crisscrossy bun thing. And she's reading a book in a porch on a, she's very relaxed. She has no reason to step forward. 
That's where she's at I right now. I love that for me, right? Because this is I the love part, that for right? Her. I love that for <laughs> too. Yeah. For sure. Um. So. So. I, I, and I hope everyone can hear how much we're playing with this, right? Like this was a scary thing at the time. This was not like, I could not play with this and laugh with this. This was really fucking dark. Excuse my language. I'll have my assistant bleep it out, right? This is dark. Um, and it was scary. And because it's dark and scary, a lot of us will avoid it. And I say, don't do it. Don't avoid it. Mm-mm. That's what you got to lean in, lean in, lean in, right? It's just scary. It's not dangerous, right? It was just scary, you know, not dangerous. And so, um, so yes, yeah, so that's the divorce say right now. And I feel good about that. You know, I feel good about yeah. that. She's been reintegrated. So that's nice. That's nice for me. The healing has become, yeah, you know, and it can happen for you too out there, right? Just <laughs> um, yeah. leaning in and leaning in. So I know we're coming to the end of the episode and, you know, we set out to have a hard conversation and transform it into teachable moments. What were your takeaways? Do you feel like we did that? I feel like we did. I um, I really appreciate like you um, providing education around like the different parts, making that connection. Um, and obviously you've had time to process, right? It's not, mm-hmm. it's not as raw and you're not in that moment anymore. Um, and hindsight is 2020. You're able to see how things fit together once you get through the motions. Mm-hmm. But that involves like sitting with those difficult feelings, right? Oh, and yes. so I think the the big takeaway is kind of like our emotions are like a spring. The more we push it down, the more intense it is when it pops up. Mm-hmm. And so we just need to, we can't push it down too far. Maybe a little bounce, but if, if we don't address it, it's, it's going to come out one way or another, right? By either us doing something drastic or our bodies will tell us to, to sit our butts down, right? Absolutely. Like feel this or I'm going to manifest in stomach aches, headaches, um, chronic disease or illness. Like it, um, I tell my clients, you know, sometimes you need temporary discomfort for permanent gain, right? This may feel mm-hmm. difficult for for a week, two weeks, a month, but mm-hmm. would you rather feel uncomfortable for a month than for the next 40 years? If you make it that long, because your body will will like break down if you don't buckle, process buckle under the pressure. Feeling. So Absolutely. yeah. Oh so yes. temporary discomfort for permanent gain. <sighs> Listeners Easier and viewers. Said than done. Right? <laughs> It's like, can you do it, right? Can you do the temporary discomfort for like long-term gain? Again, again, excuse me, your emotions are thinking short-term. We got to think long-term for them, right? We got to think long-term for them. Um, Yes, some of the things that I'm taking away, I really love how you bring in how important it is because when we think about triggers, we think it's like just the moment, right? Triggers are attached to identities and roles. That's what they're attached to. Mm. to who we feel we are as human beings and the roles and the identities that we have in this world. That's what they're attached to. So if we can really lean in and say, you know, well, what is it about my ideas around, for example, you know, with mine around being a wife, what is it around my ideas around being a mother? Well, it turns out it was actually my ideas around being a family, right. And how, how it pulled in all of that together. And so if we can do that, yeah, what could happen? (laughs) also acknowledging like not just what we think about our roles but what society thinks about our roles and how that pressures us right so Mm -hmm. um you know in let's say I mean people still think divorce is like taboo in some cultures right so if that pressure was on you that oh you're getting a divorce like why would you do that you know just stick it out then I'm sure that that was adding to it as well, right? So not just you thinking family is important, but now, oh, I got to hear everybody talk smack at Thanksgiving. I don't want to deal with this. Like what we think, what others think. Yeah. And how we tolerate what others think of us. Absolutely, right? And I just, again, like just what Deb just said, y'all, it does not matter if you are the most resilient person in the world. Enough pressure of the right kinds of pressure Mm -hmm. on you, you're going to buckle, right? We, yeah. we've got to know how to deal with these feelings or else they're going to hijack you, right? That's what they do. The job is to keep you safe at any cost, including your own life. 
right? They're, but they're thinking short term and we can do more. We can do more for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Oh, Deb, it's time for me to do my Thank internal you. weather checkout. Thank you so much for sharing, That's for being here friend. with me while I, you know, work through this and share this so that other people can hopefully talk about it as well. My internal weather checkout, now that we're here, um, mm-hmm. I'm going to see about the same image that I checked in with on the stage. Uh, she's standing. I'm standing on the stage. Oh, Is there's so a cold? dim lighting. It is dim lighting now. So this, I can actually see a lot of the stage now. Um, I can see the outlines of some of the audience. I'm smiling. My arms are open and it is warmer. The light is warm and, oh, my hair looks good. And, and the, the temperature is comfortable. It's warmer. Yay. <sighs> I love that for you. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> All right. Well, that is all we planned for today, folks. Thank you for a minute for just exploring your triggers, listening to my story, right? And just having these human to human moments. If this episode has been helpful for you and you would like to support Trigger Can We Play With That, the best thing you can do right now is just share this episode. Just share the episode with somebody who you think it's going to be helpful for, right? That's it. Let's be human. Share it. Okay. Otherwise, stay curious. <laughs>